<laughs> so hey many guys. outtakes it's not even hey guys welcome to our video that's over <laughs> hey bass lovers welcome back welcome to today's video where we are featuring bryce soderberg this is like part three five two of an interview that i started and we just started freaking rambling on I'm so fun. i don't really know how this is gonna <laughs> which part it's gonna be in but you're gonna see it and i'm gonna continue with my questions because he continue is continue on he is the bass player from Lifehouse and Comox, and so he's got a lot of cool bass shit to share with us. And, um, oh, and comment and tell us in the comment section which tip or which piece of information was the most helpful for you as a bass player, because he wants to know. He's going to be waiting. He's just going to be sitting there by his phone waiting, like, okay, call me. All day. When, when they comment, I want to know. <laughs> as soon as that pops up, right? like, ding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to jump right into the next question I had. Um... Oh, what was the one instance that happened? Okay, wait. If you guys don't know who he is, first of all, Google. And then <laughs> second of all, so he's a super successful bass player that has a really successful band, has sold tons of records, and then he's got a passion project that is well, all the people in the band are into it. He's the singer and bass player, so he's like the front man and the bass player, which how could life even get any better? And he travels around the world, and so... He's like where a lot of people want to be, where a lot of bass players want to be, like if they could, right? I think. Thank you for saying that. I, mean, <laughs> I think it's. I feel pretty fortunate. So. I think it's amazing. So I just have a million questions for you, how you got there, but I'm just gonna start. I'm gonna keep it simple. Sure. What was the one instance that happened that took bass from being a fun hobby? I'm assuming it was just a fun hobby. Yeah. I don't know. It was. Or um, that took bass from being a fun hobby to something. <laughs> oh my god like I'm going to say this again professional realm. What, yeah. yes where it was just something you did to yes. where now it was your job yes yeah um, there was an exact moment um, I was a student at Musicians Institute this was 2000 to 2001 and a lot of musicians here in town will be like I went to MI but I didn't you know I, I didn't uh, you know really take it seriously or that's not a part of huge part of who I am MI was great for me, and I met a lot of great musicians through that uh, school uh, and, and great contacts. Uh, but I auditioned for this band, Barry Squire, who's an agent here in Los Angeles. He finds um, musicians for bands that have record deals and stuff. He's the one that got me the gig for BT. Yeah, he's the best. He he's is, awesome he dude. is. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, um, thanks, Barry. Shout out. Barry. So um, <laughs> he got me an audition for this band called AM Radio. This was 2002, and they were managed by Rivers Cuomo, the lead singer of Weezer at the time, put the band together. They lost their bass player, and they were about to go on tour with Weezer, opening up for them all over the world. I don't know what happened with this bass player, but um, I went in for the audition, and I, I remember listening to the music. I loved the music. I stayed up for two days straight, just learning all these songs, learning how to sing them. Being a singing bass player in bands, it gets you... Someone told me when I first came to L.A., it gets you twice as many gigs. And I didn't start singing until I was 21. Mm -hmm. Like, I started late, like, way late in the game. Yeah. But I just worked at it. Me um, too. I was, like, 20. I mean, I always sang as a kid, but, mm -hmm. like, to mix them two together, yeah. I was about 25. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so so that was a huge catalyst to getting the gig. Um, did a cattle call audition for AM radio. There was, like, 30 other bass players or something, and I got the gig. And at that moment, when I got that phone call saying, I'm about to go on tour with Weezer all over the world, playing arenas, you know, going from a kid that was at the school, like, just, you know, playing in garages and here and there, that was, like, the defining moment. I remember calling my dad and be like, Dad, I need clothes, I need gear, I need a cool bass, <laughs> and you gotta buy it for me now, because I, no, I had no money. Like, I was living here in L.A., like basically with like seven bucks in my pocket and he bought me a Rickenbacker and he bought me an ATV uh, 810 or uh, yeah uh, four no 810 stack um, wow and, uh, thanks and an dad SBT. yeah yeah <laughs> I still use it thank you dad and uh, that that was the moment where I realized that this is the path that I wanted to be on and uh, pursue and that kind of crossed me over to the professionalism of music that is so cool. Yeah. So there was something that you said that, like, you took that audition seriously. Yes. You spent two days learning that mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. And that is awesome. So you got to put in your time. And then um, the other thing that I was, I wanted to bring up, too, is about, like, when you're going to get a gig um, or you're going to audition, to be a team player and to just kind of 
fit into what, uh, like, I don't know how to say this. It's like, instead of going there with the attitude, well, uh, I, well, I can't play on Tuesdays. Yeah. Wait, you want me to audition on Sunday? Hold on. That's mm-hmm. like a holy day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or like, yeah. you know, I'm busy Saturday night. Like, yeah. you, you got to just be like available because they've already got their whole plan and their whole schedule. Yeah. And so you just have to put whatever, like if you're annoyed by something or what, you just got to put that to the side and just be like, I'm going to be there early. I'm going to know all the songs better than all the other guys. And I'm going to stay later and I'm going to be nice. I'm going to smell good. Yeah. You know, whatever it takes. (laughs) You got to be stoked to be there. You know, and that crop carries over to even continuing with the gig. You always want to be the guy that's stoked to be there. You know, you want to be happy to be doing the gig and, I learned the hard way. There was a band called Abandoned Pools. I'm friends with Tommy, the singer of this band now, but I auditioned for them before AM radio. I mm-hmm. showed up and I was dressed in this monstrous, I don't even know, <laughs> this baggy silver pants and like, I had like a, a beach uh, like necklace with seashells on it and, and I was I was playing a five string Music Man Stingray. Mm-hmm. And I remember, because Tommy used to play bass for a band called Eels, the mm-hmm. Eels, a yeah. huge band. And he, I remember afterwards, he told me that I didn't get the gig because I didn't know how to play with a pick, and I, I had that five string, and he was like this Fender playing four string kind of rock guy. I showed up for that gig, and I didn't adapt to the situation of right. what it should have been. I was kind of just doing my own thing. Oh my god, that is such a good. But point. there's a fine line, like you have to, like obviously you have to be you and bring your personality to the gig, and be the best version of you. But you, you have to like adapt and mold to it as well. It's yeah. kind of like there's a threshold. You know? No, but and you want to do your research too, because mm-hmm. like. For example, I was auditioning for um, the singer from Train, Pat Monahan. Yeah. He had another, he had Pat Monahan, right? Yeah. And my friend was the guitar player, and we awesome. were in another band. So I was like, I was, I, I like had a really good chance of getting it yeah. just because like we all knew each other. And I hate to say it, but that's sometimes how you, that's at yeah. least how you get that's auditions how sometimes. Life. That's how I got in Lifehouse. So I show up with my specter, <laughs> right? And I'm just which like is a great bass, with my by active way. specter, which yeah. is like just a metal rock bass, and mm-hmm. I love it, and I love you, specter, right? Yeah. I mean, that was just that's my tone, right? Yes, yes. But this gig was like it was a Fender P bass gig. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like a retro outfit, Run like, of the mill. A, yeah. like a like a. What is it? What is Echo Park? <laughs> what do they call hipster? Yeah, it hipster. was like if I showed up in like a yeah. hipster outfit uh-huh. with a Fender P bass. Like you just like, went to Coachella. I would have been in, but I show up with my yeah. freaking Spectre and my black hair with the red streaks, and, and, and they're just like. <laughs> there's nothing horribly wrong with that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Spectre, great sounding bass. Yeah. But it was certain, literally the wrong sound. You got to think about also like who's watching you and who, you know. Yeah, it, it might it might have been the wrong sound. It might be a little too punchy. Yeah, there's a lot like there. He's a singer songwriter. Yes. it's that style of music like Train. You look at I what mean, Train, train? would have done. Yeah, I mean, listen to the bass lines. It's not like the dude's yeah. pumping out a Specter in there. But like the he's... Meet Virginia bass line is awesome, by the way. That's a cool <laughs> one. But um, yeah, I mean, for that gig, I probably would have showed up with a. I would have showed up with a jazz bass. See, and yeah. he would have got the gig, and that's Maybe. why he's. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> but he was already on tour with Lifehouse, yeah. so he was busy. He's like, I can't. But but you know. I, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how you said um, you have to be the guy that's stoked to be at the gig, right? Yeah. Or to be Not at super the audition. stoked like you're a meth head, but. That's awesome. This is a reminder for me to make a gratitude list. Just saying. Um, <laughs> I need to do one too. I'm grateful to be here. <laughs> I'm grateful he's here. I'm grateful you're all here. <laughs> See, we did it. Check. Did. Done. Check. Done. Um, but yeah, if you're the guy that's there like, when are we going to eat? You know, mm. or like, man, they haven't even fed us all day. Like, they could at least give us free beer. I mean, like, if you're just like that kind of like expecting stuff, I mean, it's okay to be hungry and deal with it mm-hmm. but to like it's first impression you know you know what i mean you're That's, just you don't yeah. want to just be the dick you know what i'm well, saying well you're on stage 5% of the time when you're in a band and the rest of it 95% you're hanging out you're traveling you're you're doing something else and you're that, in a squeeze little bus yeah. like sleeping so, underneath the other guy yeah no one you wants to be a dick someone, the first 5 minutes not even a dick just like no one wants to be in a band with a guy who's got bad hygiene that's like can't adapt to a situation that you or know maybe if you're, you're, if you're irritable, in a conversation yeah, or, or you're in a conversation you just like you, you have to be personable yeah. and like 
if you're playing with an artist who's like a solo artist that's a big name or something like maybe the band doesn't engage with that person as much like if i joined prince's band you know like when he was here you probably, would probably never wouldn't look him in the to, eye. yeah you would <laughs> yeah. probably never talk yeah. to prince he's in like, his own you, bus that's prince you know that's, yeah so in fact you wouldn't even call him prince yeah call he would him just be majesty. like a sound yeah. he would just be like mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. hello mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. so adaptability um you know that's the key yeah yeah let's see what else we got okay let me just read this because this looks long oh my god We all know the music industry has completely collapsed. (laughs) What was once a feasible career... This is going to be a hard question. Sure. What was once a feasible career is now something much harder to get into and get a good paying gig. What advice would you give someone that's young and passionate, but at that stage where they're like, should I do this professionally or as a hobby? Mm. And be honest, what can a working musician playing as a hired gun what kind of money can they make? Or can you give some examples of income levels of people that people can expect? Like, like American Idol was just looking for a bass player, and I got mm. the news, like, the day after they found the person, you know? Right, right. But then I look at them, and I'm like, well, how much... Mu- it would be awesome. It would be amazing. I would yeah. love that gig, but how much does that really pay? Like, does that... Yeah. Maybe that is one of the top-paying gigs. And mm. then, like, but if you're hired to play, like, um, you're just going to be the bass player for... Like, uh, let's say you're hired in Sticks. You know, it's it, it was a big band, yeah. and it still is a big band, yeah. but you're not a songwriter. You're not getting any royalties. You're not going to be on the next album, right? You're just going to play the gig. Mm-hmm. So what kind of... I know I just asked, like, five questions. Yeah, there's... No, but they're all good <laughs> questions. You know, they're all good questions. First off, um, the music industry is only collapsed to a certain degree, just not contradictory. It's collapsed for me. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> you know, it's it's a double-edged sword, and I tell this to a lot of young kids that are asking about getting into the music industry, is from when I started in Lifehouse, bands were selling records. We mm-hmm. sold, you know, our first record sold two and a half million. Yeah. Uh, the, the record, the yellow record, sold a million. Um, that was kind of the end of days when it came to uh, selling records because you know at the time Napster was getting bigger, uh, streaming was starting out, and now streaming. With the steam. Yes, I know, <laughs> I know. But again, it's a double-edged sword. Like nowadays, Lifehouse, our Spotify streams are still over three million a month. Wow. Our Pandora streams are over three million a month. That's and if you incredible. talk to Jason, who's the core songwriter, obviously he's going to get fractions of pennies and not like it used to be with radio play where you, you make a lot more money. Yeah. But our touring industry has increased in dramatically. We'll have shows and play these festivals where we'd have all sorts of new fans, young and old, that will come out. And that's where I make most of my money is through touring. Okay, and, um, I have a question on that. Sure. So because I've heard a lot of people say this, I'm not saying my bass community has said this, but people that aren't musicians say, oh, you know, stop whining about not selling records, just go on tour. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but you're a big band where you're, you're able to sell tickets. Like Mm -hmm. if my band goes on tour, (laughs) it's just going to be like frantic who, what, Right. you know what I mean? So it's like, unless you've got that um, built in fan base, Mm -hmm. you might not be able to do that. It's trickier. I, but it's all doable. I think it comes to that core mentality. Of I love method. your positive. Well, attitude. yeah, obviously it comes See, down it's to positive. And any business because you meditate. I do meditate. Yeah, that's, a big <laughs> thing. <laughs> that's a good question, though. You're so right on that. And and obviously you really have to believe in what you're doing in any business that you're in. That's a big thing. You always have to believe in it. But yeah, there's there's um, there's pledge music campaigns you can start off. You, nowadays, people understand the way that a, a little bit more so that the music industry, there isn't as much money in the business side of it as much. So when we tour, yeah, we'll do VIP packages or we'll sell our merchandise and there's things like that. And yes, we do have a name. So we have our way of, of, of you know making money from fans a little bit more so than anyone starting out. But yeah, um, pledge music campaigns, you can raise money for your banned by um, doing packages and, and fun little events for fans or people that you're building. You just have to engage uh, with with social media as much as possible. And in order to start something out you, you with any business, especially the music business, you can't think that you're going to make money right away. It's, you have to build your brand first. Uh, this is what I'm struggling with with Comax at, at sometimes is 
I have to create um, you know a lot of social media content engagement engage this new fan base and create my own brand then go out on tour um, and with VIP packages or um, you know through playing gigs the right setups there's there's ways of doing it but it's trickier if you're starting your own thing mm -hmm. if we're talking about auditioning for other bands that's that's a whole other entity because mm -hmm. these bands have already created their brand and established that and you're joining on to something mm -hmm. so they can afford to pay you a certain way um but um yeah it, it's it's just it's a different market that we're in right now does that answer your question am i there's so many points to this i know that was so a, that layers. was a loaded question i yeah. feel like that was like 20 questions uh -huh. but um so like let's say that somebody's new and they're like wow well, should i go be a professional bass player or should i go like mm -hmm be an IT. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Be yeah. like like learn computers and, I and like definitely do think an AI artificial intelligence. You know? I don't think you should let the state of the industry impact um, your desire to create and be a musician at all in this day and age. I think it's important. There's so many tools to express yourself. I know kids that are bass players that are on YouTube and make their living like doing channels where they're playing or or engaging like you can create your own brand these days that's the way it is it's yeah. long gone are the days where you get a major label and they make you big yeah. it's like you make yourself now okay and anyone can do it it's po it's, all, it's possible right and that's that double edged sword with yes. the whole streaming thing too yes. is that you can just stream your stuff it's just is anybody going to hear it cuz now mm -hmm. it's like there's a ton of it right mm -hmm. and it's how to get it in front of people yes so like let's say that um somebody was wondering well should i be should I try and get in a band where I'm part songwriter so I can get royalties in the back end? Mm -hmm. Or should I just be a hired gun? Yes. Like, do you have an opinion on that? Well, I'd say you need to start off with... I started off as a hired gun because I felt like that's the path at the time that I needed to do. And um, later on, I went into more of the songwriting, producing elements. and, and But first, I, I went with what was in front of me and what came to me. And... Um, you know, being a hired gun that was was a blast. I, that's how I started and got my, you know, cut my teeth in the music industry. I think it just depends on the situation with where you're at. You just have to maximize your ability and, you know, take guidance and advice from people that know, you know, or know you and where you're at. Like everyone has a different, unique situation that needs to yeah. be tailored to. So, yeah. um, it you know, in Los Angeles, there's much more opportunities as a hired gun than it would be in a lot of other places in the world, but. You can also live in Ohio and have a great YouTube page where it shows you playing with bands or without, and then maybe, you know, someone from Corn sees you and hires you, or that. That's yeah. how the singer of Journey got discovered was on YouTube. You know, it's really. It's, oh yeah, yeah, this that kid from the Philippines was singing in a cover band, and Neil <laughs> Sean was like, "He's awesome. Let's get him." And they got that him is to so be their cool. So, yeah. That's how the guitar player. Um, um, that is now in Styx Zadra. Mm. Um, that's how he got the gig. Just, I mean, he was already doing a, a lot of high profile stuff. Yeah. But I guess um, Dennis DeYoung's son saw him late at night on YouTube and was like, "Oh my God, you got to hear this guy." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's so many different avenues, but I would never say to someone if you truly love and believe in yourself as a musician, like give up on it because of the state of the industry. I think yeah. that there's always a way to do what you you know believe in and finding your purpose is a key component like I still you know we're always searching for our purpose but I feel like my purpose was bass chose me and, and I heard it it did that is so sweet I, I heard I it know. I know like I, I heard bass lines as a kid and I was so fascinated by them I, I had know. to do it I just it, it wasn't like I'm gonna force myself to do this it just called me you know and that is so cool so if that I is love that to someone else then you got oh my god that's yeah. why we're all here together we're like we're base lovers <laughs> dude <laughs> oh it. my god and so and there's also one thing i heard the other day was that um this woman was giving advice for a totally different area of life but she was saying that like um, your best investment is to invest in yourself so like you went to mi which is was Expensive then for the time. And, and the Canadian dollar was super low, by the way. It was 60 cents to the dollar, so it was twice as much. Wow. 
And then you weren't, um, weren't you a Canadian citizen, so it was more expensive, right? Much more expensive. Oh, my God. I worked as a waiter for months and months and months and saved I'm up. surprised that even being a waiter would, would pay for that. <laughs> I know, well, I mean, my parents helped, really... too. I'm oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. So, I needed that, you know. So you invested in yourself in what you wanted to do, yes. right? And actually, the theme of what I heard was... Um, how to get the life that you want, like what it takes. And she's like, it takes grit. Mm -hmm. It takes like spending a lot of money if mm -hmm. you want to invest in it. Like let's say you want to be a doctor. You can't just sit there and be like, well, I really wanted to be a doctor. Like you're 80 and you're dying. And you're like, I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't have the money. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could have found a way yeah. to get the money there's even though you're going to pay it back for 20 years. Just like you're saying, there's, there's always a way. If you want something bad enough. It's and true. to not use excuses, like, because mm -hmm. you know what? I was going to go to MI in 1998, and do you know why I didn't go? You guys, this is, you better learn from this. I didn't have a car, mm. so I couldn't get to MI, and I was living in the valley. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I would, like, had to take this, they had, like, one train that yeah. went, like. That was a know, different time that it was, like, uh, there was no Uber. There were no, yeah, there were no <laughs> buses or Uber, and there yeah. was, like, one train that went, yeah. like, one time of the day. Yeah. And so, and I was, like. Man, you yeah. know, I guess I'll just not do that. I'll just play bass in these bands, whatever. And it was like, it was just a struggle. And then, and the other piece of advice I want to give people is don't waste your fucking time. Like, don't waste your time mm -hmm. in shitty bands that are just not doing anything. I mean, because cause I'm always thinking, oh, well, but, you know, maybe the, they we're going to write a good song. Mm -hmm. We're one song away from yeah. being famous. Like, you know, but it was just like. Week after week in rehearsal, I knew I was wasting my time, but I thought fun. I'm putting in my time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was, and I look back and I'm like, I wasted years doing that. Of course, but in those bands, but it's never really. If you're not having fun, then definitely no. I I I, I firmly believe that if you're not having fun doing it, then there's no point in doing a certain layer of you know being in a band or whatever. But I personally, by you saying you wasted time with these bands, I'm sure you gained so much experience and well, knowledge. Well, I did, and, yeah. and I was having fun. Yeah. But still, like I, I would look at the band and be like, "Okay, this is our name." Like I knew that the branding wasn't on. Mm -hmm. I knew that the songs were kind of there, but not totally. I yeah. knew that this guy wasn't fully invested in the band, but this guy was. Yeah. And it, and it was just, and I was like, well, this one I don't know about that person. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was just like I always kind of knew, but I wouldn't listen. Yeah to myself because uh, I would always make excuses for the band like well you know I'll just give it let me give it you know six more months or whatever yeah. and then I would end up uh, joining bands where you know they're paying me like $150 for a rehearsal so I was like oh well it's money and yeah and I feel like that was money but it was just a waste of time like I could have been home honing my songwriting skills and that's why now when people try to hire me for a cover gig they're like oh it's $300 it's only mm -hmm. it's only an hour and a half gig and I'm like yeah but you don't understand I'm going to be practicing those songs for like at least three weeks because there's probably 60 songs on mm -hmm. the list. Yeah. And then I'm going to have to go travel to Palm Springs and do the thing. And then, and it's just like, that's like a month of my life mm -hmm. for a $300 gig. Like when you really do the math on like yeah. what it's going to take, yeah, I'll know 60 more songs. Yeah. But I mean, do, do I, it, if you feel it's a month of my yeah. life. So now I just tell them no. Yeah. And that's how I've been able to put on, putting on my third record now. Cause I just, yeah. I have more time. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. And, and that it should be like, if you're not going to find fulfillment in something that in the music industry, especially, then there's no point in doing it. I, I lately I've started to do cover gigs, but I find that there's fulfillment in it. And for me, I'll go to Vegas and play covers because a, I get to lead sing and I get to better myself as an entertainer performance, like going for a workout at the gym and it's great money. And I feel fulfilled doing it. It's fun. I never did the cover gig thing when I was younger. Yeah. So I, I've always been in original bands. So for me, I would do that. But yeah, if, if you're not finding fulfillment in it, if you're working on someone else's shift and it's crappy situation and this or that, then yeah, you definitely have to ask yourself, is this worth it? Am, am I happy? Have, again, there's, it's like playing poker or any other sport. You have to adapt with what's right in front of you and just, just use your best judgment, you know? Yeah. I've, I've, I've made tons of mistakes. I've, I've been with tons of bands before any of this happened. Like... I probably played in 50, 60 bands before I was in Lifehouse. And all of them wow. failed. Wow. Yeah, easily. A lot Are of you like 108 years old? I know, right? You just have <laughs> like secret I mean, if you screen? counted, uh, <laughs> there's a revolving door when I was going to MI oh of different God. bands. But in Los Angeles, yeah. like, and Shit. I, yeah. Playing just gigs here and there. Yeah, it's maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe 40, 50. Okay, I have two final questions, but 
I wanted to go back to something we talked about before. Sure. Where we're being the lead singer and the bass player. Yeah. Right? Have you noticed, because I've noticed when I'm just the bass player, I can just go crazy on stage. Mm -hmm. But when I'm the singer, I'm like attached to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and then I've even contemplated, oh, I'm going to get the headset. I'm going to mm -hmm. be Madonna with the, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, that's ridiculous. And then I'm, yeah. I'm afraid it's not going to work. So then, And then I realize like the songs that I write aren't really heavily, they don't have like really long guitar solos. Mm -hmm. They're like super like tight songs, you know, and they have like a guitar solo here and there. Yeah. But um, I'm like attached to the microphone the whole time. Yes. Have you noticed that you have like less fun running around on stage than you did when like you're not singing in a band i think there's a lot more responsibilities yeah i mean w with comox definitely there are times where I'm, you're glued to the microphone and also you're aware like my guitar player in comox he's not a huge showman so mm -hmm. i have to kind of double up my efforts and lifehouse jason is very much glued to the microphone so i have to be more animated yeah. to bigger crowds or else we're going to look like right. boring. So, yeah. so it, again, I use this adaptability thing, this, of uh, you know, um, that, that phrase a lot, but you kind of have to see what kind of band you're in. Is your, is your guitar player a super showman? Can you get away with doing less or more? But as a singer, yeah, you, uh, that's why that cover gig thing in Vegas that I've been doing has been a blast because I'm just letting loose and screwing around and I get to yeah. like be in front of people and try out stuff and then when I come back and I do Comox or even Lifehouse where I sing lead I can get my movements down you can always you can always engage and and you know if you do a kick or whatever you know some people do you know <laughs> like there's a band called the Lemon Twigs this this kid is amazing and he's glued to the mic but he's always doing this big kick and putting his hand up and he's grabbing the mic with one hand or two hands or putting the bass behind his back or you're you know you're whatever you know it's, so you practice your kicks in in vegas no so go to vegas to see, see bryce kicks. practices kicks Boosh. <laughs> i shouldn't have been talking about that but, um, no i'm glad because now i'm thinking i should kick <laughs> kicking is I'm one gonna... thing <laughs> Kicking. We're, we know that's our next segment is rock kicks. Yeah. Rock kicks. Yeah, Watch stage David moves. Lee Roth. David Lee stage Roth. Stage moves. Yeah. Okay, so if, let's say that, that our watchers, our bass community, our bass lovers, um, want to pursue music as a career, what are the three things you would tell them to never forget ever? I feel like you've touched on some of them, mm -hmm. but just to wrap them up. Sure. Um, number one is... Um, purpose and fulfillment if you feel like you're playing or you're you you connect to music in a way where you you find purpose and fulfillment from it this, then that is a path for you like my parents don't listen to music that much it's not their purpose it's not their fulfillment they enjoy it sometimes but if you're if you play music and, and it's there boom and that goes to number two like you have to love it you have to love what you're doing. Um, if it's not fun for you, if you're frustrated, if you feel like it's cutting into something, then it's not for you, and that's okay. You know, you don't, you don't have to. But if you if you love it, you really love it. That's what I tell the to, told the kids that I was teaching when I was a teacher, is, um, you know, doing exercises. You know, it's sometimes you have to do the stuff that's not as fun so that you can get to the stuff that is fun and do it way better, which makes it even more fun, yeah. you know? Um, and number three, if you're going to be in a band, make sure you're with people you like. You know, I'm always saying if you're going to start a long-term thing with people that are musicians, uh, you want to make sure that you, you grow with them and you have fun with them instead of, you know, someone stepping on you or being egotistical or bullying or any... You just have to be with good people, and that's why the longevity of Lifehouse has worked the way that it has. And uh, I think that that's kind of key for Oh my musicians. God, that's incredible. 18 years, right? Yep. I had a friend that told me she quit music for her boyfriend because mm. her boyfriend like didn't want her in the band, whatever. There's okay. some jealousy stuff going on. Yeah. And um, now they aren't even together. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Again, I right? Think that, I think so that's it's one... like some of the things like m like make it a priority too. Like yeah. if that's your draw in life, like yeah. don't let anyone stand in the way, right? Yeah, you were talking about excuses that you make for mm -hmm. the band. I mean, that's also her excuse to not do music too. Yeah. If she's with someone and she quits music, 
what's more important to you? I want to thank you so much for having me. i be a part of this today. Oh You're God, such a lovely I person. It. I you know, loved it. We had so much fun. You have so much passion for the instrument. You have so, so much passion for music. And, you know, that inspires me. I'm just so glad to be here and share this with you today. Good. So that's the first thing. Second is, um, you know, if you are watching and you're, you know, whatever level you're at with bass, um, you know, it's it's an instrument. At least it it called me out, and and it was something that meant a lot to me. It was such a very passionate thing. I pursued that path. I could have gone in a bunch of other paths, but um, I had a lot of support. I had a lot of help, but I also kept believing in what I was doing. And I'm I'm I mean I'm I have a fulfilled life with the instrument. I feel great with it, whatever level I'm at. If I'm living in a ditch, if I'm the king of the world, wherever I have a bass, it's something that's. You know, it's unconditional love to me. There, it doesn't talk back to me. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's it's just there, yeah. and and it will always be there. And um, you know, if you find a meaning in that, in whatever path you are, if whether it be bass or any instrument, then you're in pole position and you're winning. And um, you know, there's a lot of really good examples of that here. You have that love for the instrument, and it shows in who I you do. are. And um, hopefully, that shows in. At you, you know, anyone who's watching and, um, you know, it, it transgresses into part of your life. So um, thank you for having me on here. Thank you guys for watching this video. Thanks for coming in, Bryce. I know we've talked your ear off and talked about so much shit and we're just trying to uh, figure out how we're going to edit these. We're going to have like 18 videos for you guys. So this is awesome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes. So thank you for joining us. And again, put in the comment section what you found the most helpful in these videos. So we'll see you on the next one.